Well, welcome to Rock Harbor. Good to see everybody here in this auditorium. Also, our online audience, so good to see you today. Thank you for being with us. And then also, our audience is actually over in the Rock Harbor East Campus, which is like right over here in the band room. Um, let's give it up for them over there right now. Can we do that? Thank you, guys. Well, Merry Christmas. We're so good. It's so good to see each and every one of you here. And this is such a fun time of the year. It's such a fun season to think about. It's almost Christmas. It happens tomorrow, and we're all very excited for that. But for us, I think a lot of us, it starts uh, maybe even a month ahead of time, right? It starts with Thanksgiving, and we celebrate Thanksgiving, and we sit around the table, and there's just so much to be grateful for, so much to be thankful for. And then the following day, um, we all go out and try to buy as much stuff as we possibly can. It's called Black Friday, right? And it's a really exciting time. Well, a few years ago, I was actually out on Black Friday, and uh, having a great time and I got up to get ready to check out and uh, there was a guy who was in front of us a little bit and he, I think he had forgotten that the day before was actually Thanksgiving and so he wasn't very thankful at that time. As a matter of fact, he was kind of upset. Um, he was actually kind of giving the girl behind the counter the business a little bit and I'm kind of just standing there watching it all unfold and happen and think, man, dude, yesterday was Thanksgiving. Can we just be a little bit happier? And then it kind of hit me like, what if that was my daughter behind the counter? How would I respond or how would I feel about him doing that? And I did what any red-blooded American father would do. I had to say something. And I finally said, hey, man, it's not her fault. Can we just chill out a little bit? And he whipped around. And I said to myself, I said, yeah. I said, this is not good. <laughs> I could already see the article in the paper, right? Local pastor arrested for fighting over Christmas gifts on Black Friday. That's not exactly the headline you're wanting, just so you know. And, uh, and so I was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do right now? And, and then he kind of just looked at me, and then he like calmed down a little bit and didn't say anything, and he turned around and began to apologize to the girl. I'm like, wow, that's cool. And, and then he began to apologize to people in line, and I, I said, man, Smith and Wesson is here today, right? <laughs> and we got this thing covered. We're good to go. And, and then I finally got ready to go check out, and I picked, took my axe, and I put it up there to buy it. Um, and I realized, what? I realized why maybe he, he thought he shouldn't mess with me at that time. Um, it wasn't Smith or Wesson. It wasn't me. Um, it might have been an ax. Um, and here's the thing. If that story was true, um, that would be awesome. But I made that whole thing up. But it would be awesome. And, and here's the thing about Christmas and about Thanksgiving is that we all come into it with different perspectives. I mean, this is a fun time of the year. We think about gifts that we're going to give. We think about clothes that we're going to buy for somebody that one day um, they're either going to outgrow or maybe they're going to fade and no longer wear those clothes. We buy gifts for to or toys for kids and we think, man, if they have this toy, they're going to be so excited to have this toy. And then they play with the box. And we're like, what's up with that, right? And one day we're going to sell that toy at a garage sale for 50 cents. It's going to be awesome. We think about maybe a gaming console or a game that we're going to buy that our kids are going to play for a time and then it's going to end up being out of style and we're no longer going to play that game. Or we buy golf balls that are going to be lost, right? That's what's going to happen with golf balls. And we think about, man, this is what Christmas is about. It's about the gifts that we give. And we know that that's not true. Truly, it's the meaning behind Christmas is not the gift that we give. It's the gift that's been given to us. I read a story about a guy that he, he actually was getting ready to uh, get his girlfriend a, a, a gift for Christmas, and they were getting pretty serious, and as they were getting pretty serious, and Christmas was leading up, he, he asked her right before Christmas, he said, hey, what's your ring size? Now, ladies, when you hear someone ask you what your ring size is, what do you think you're going to get for Christmas? A ring, right? You're like, he went Beyonce. He liked it, so he put a ring on it or something. I don't know. Um, but, but it's like, no, no, that wasn't his point. His point was he was asking her about a ring because he was actually going to give her a bowling ball for Christmas. Yeah, that's a sad deal. That is a bad perspective, right? <laughs> Note to self, guys. You do that for your wife, enjoy Christmas by yourself. I mean, it's, it's a great way to be single by the following Christmas, right? So just that we all have these different perspectives of what Christmas is truly all about. And so today, I thought maybe we would kind of walk through the story of Christmas. And most of us here today, we probably know this story. It's found in Luke 2. And we find the story of a couple different people and, and what was their perspective? What was happening during that time? What did it look like for them? Today, we're going to look at those three different perspectives. And we have three chairs behind me. We're going to talk about what must it have been like for Mary? Mary was at a different place in life. What must it have been like for Joseph? I mean, Joseph, the guy who's supposed to be marrying Mary, what, what is he going to respond that, to that with? And then we also have the perspective of where are we today? 
with Jesus? What's going on in our own hearts, in our own lives? So if you have your Bibles, please go ahead and turn to the book of Luke and chapter number two, and we're going to look at a couple of different verses and kind of just walk through this a little bit today. Luke 2, verse number 10, the Bible says this, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now we read that, and many of us, we've read that many times in our life. We've heard it taught and preached for years and years and years. And we go, wow, one day, one day, Christ the Lord is going to be born. And we know what happened with that. But you know, when Mary was walking through this, she didn't understand everything that was about to take place. If we were to take a seat and kind of put our our heads in, in where Mary was at at that time, we would realize that Mary was a girl that at the time was about 12 to 14 years old. She was very young. She didn't understand everything that was happening. She didn't understand why this was happening, but she had been chosen to give birth to the Son of God. And what would her response be when she finds out that she is pregnant? She's never been with a man. She's engaged to be married. She's engaged to spend the rest of her life with Joseph, and now she is pregnant. What do you think that her emotions or feelings would have been at that time? I can't help but think that, that as, the, as the angel told her what was about to happen, that she was thinking, well, why me? Of all people, God, why, why would you choose me to do this? She probably also was thinking about her reputation. You see, in that culture, if you got pregnant before you were married and with, a, with your husband, I mean, you literally, you lost everything. You couldn't even get a job as a single mom during that time of day. How was she going to supply for this baby? How was she going to take care of this baby? There had to be fear that creeped in. I mean, for those who have children currently, when you find out that, that you're pregnant, right, you're like, you're scared to death because you're like, what am I going to do with this child? I remember the day that we went home with our firstborn. Joy and I looked at each other and thought, what do we do now? I mean, they actually sent this child home with us. What are we going to do? We were scared out of our minds. We just kind of sat there and looked at him like, okay, you can hang in your little swing and bouncer chair and hopefully we'll know what to do next, right? Mary's by herself. She's thinking, what am I going to do right now? There had to be great fear. Her reputation is gone. And we know that she could have been killed for being pregnant and not being married at that point. What was she going to do? How was she going to respond? We find that Mary responds just like anybody would who knew that God was with her. She trusted Jesus and God with everything that she had. I love what Luke 2.19 says about Mary and what her feelings were at that time. It says this, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Mary in her heart just believed that God had a plan, that God had a purpose for her that she didn't understand at the time, but she was going to trust God. Have you ever been there before? Where you're like, God, I don't understand why I'm in this circumstance. God, this doesn't make sense to me at all. None of this makes sense. I don't understand why this happened to me. God, this wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything. Why did this happen to my son or my daughter or my mom or my dad or my spouse? God, why am I still single? I mean, what's your plan for my life? Those are real questions that we have at times. And I just have to believe that Mary was asking all those questions. She had to be afraid. She had to doubt. But we also know that she trusted And she believed and said, I'm going to go forward with this because I know that God has a greater plan than I could ever think, than I could ever dream, or I could ever imagine. She said, I'm just going to trust him. And then we have Joseph, the guy that's supposed to marry Mary. The guy that said, I'm committed my life to you for the rest of your life. Now, guys, just imagine with me for a moment. If you're married, if you've been engaged before, the person you're about to marry comes to you and says, hey, I just need to let you know something. Um, we've never been together, and I've never been with anybody, um, but I'm pregnant. He's going, huh? Like, like, what do you mean? I mean, how, how's that happen? Well, I know how it happens. But how did you get, that doesn't make any sense. Well, what happened was the Holy Spirit did this. The holy who, right? I mean, the holy what? What's holy about that? I mean, I don't get that. 
sorry, babe, I, I want to believe you, but I'm not sure that I'm tracking with you right now. I'm not sure that I'm believing what you're throwing down. I'm not sure that this actually happened like this because I know how it happens. That's never happened before. This has never happened in the history of the world. How are you going to tell me that you're pregnant, but it's from the Holy Spirit? Makes no sense to him. Joseph has a choice to make. What am I going to do in this situation? How am I going to handle it? We know that Joseph loved Mary deeply. And we find out in those beginning times, he's just like, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm not going to marry her, but I'm going to just love her. And I'm not going to do anything that would be mean or hurtful to her. You see, in that culture, it would have been very common in this situation for him to take her, put her out into the street. She would have been thrown into a pit or a cistern, and people would walk by with stones and throw them at her and kill her. That was perfectly acceptable in that day and age. But that wasn't what Joseph chose to do. He chose to put her away and say, we're not going to do anything right now. Until one night, he has a dream. And in that dream, he is told, he said, you need to listen to Mary and you need to trust her because what she's telling you, it's true. Now, I don't know about you, but you probably have had a dream before, right? Sometimes you wake up from a dream and you're like, was that really a dream or did that really happen? For some of you, you probably believe that your dreams are true, like they're real. You wake up and you're like mad at your spouse because you're like, this is what you did to me last night in your dream. This is what you said. This, you, you treated me very inappropriately. You were not kind to me at all. It's like, babe, it was a dream. No, it wasn't a dream. It was real. I mean, I felt it. I feel it now, right? Joseph has this dream and he has to make a choice. Am I going to trust it or not? For some of us, I, I probably would have thought, you know what? I, I had pizza last night. I think I have acid indigestion, maybe a little acid reflux. That wasn't a dream. I just didn't digest things well, right? My Prilosec OTC didn't work like it was supposed to, right? And now I'm just like, what do I do in this situation? Joseph has to make a choice, and he chooses to follow through with what he started with. He chose to say, I'm going to love her, and I'm going to trust her, because I believe exactly what she said has happened. Think of the betrayal he must have felt in the very beginning of that. You ever been betrayed before? You feel like one person said one thing and then did something completely different, and they betrayed you. Maybe we betrayed somebody else before. Betrayed a trust. Betrayed a love. Betrayed them. That feeling is deep, and it's hurtful. And Joseph experienced all those same feelings that you and I feel today. And as he listens to Mary, and as he trusts her and believes her, he knows he has some choices to make. What's he going to do with this? Luke 2.1 says this. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And what this meant for that time was is that everybody needed to go back to their original town that they were born in, and they needed to pay their taxes. Why did they need to pay taxes? Well, because during that time the Roman Empire had about 500,000 soldiers. And they needed money to pay for all those soldiers. So Caesar Augustus said, the only way we can do that is by making people pay taxes. Taxes are not a new thing. How many of us enjoy paying taxes? Don't raise your hand. None of us do. None of us get excited about paying taxes. But all the way back very in the very beginning of the birth of Jesus, they were having to pay taxes, just like you and I do today time, they were in the city of Nazareth, which is where they lived. But you see, 700 years previously, the prophet Micah had prophesied that baby Jesus, the Messiah, would come, and he would be born in Bethlehem. 700 years previously, this was the plan that God had laid out. And Mary and Joseph were just part of the plan. And so now they had to go and take a journey from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem. It was about 70 five miles. Now we hear 75 miles and we go, oh, no big deal. I mean, it's like driving from here to Cascade, Idaho. It's about 78 miles there. We think about that road, right? It's windy. It's all over the place. You get to follow the river. It's beautiful. But a lot of places, it's actually really rough. It's not a great road to be on. It's not a wonderful road to drive on. But can you imagine doing that on a donkey? Because that was their mode of transportation, Oh yeah, I get it. This donkey's fast, right? It's going to be okay. 
But it's not that fast. And now Joseph and Mary, they have to go on this little road trip 75 miles away. And we think, man, that that wasn't that big of a deal. But it was because it was on a donkey. And she was eight to nine months pregnant. She was expecting at any time she could have this baby. And so they begin to go on this journey. Can you just imagine what that must have been like for Mary and for Joseph? Joseph gets her up on the donkey and they're going along. He's like, hey, babe, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, good. Do you need anything? No, I'm good. Hey, do you need to stop? Yeah, I need to stop. Oh, you do? Okay, let's get you down. We'll go down. We'll do what we need to do. All right, let's get back. Let's keep going. And we continue on and on. And he says it again. Are you okay? Yeah, you're good. Hey, do you need to stop? Yeah, I do. Hey, babe, this is a road trip. We don't stop on road trips, right? This is point A to point B. He's a guy, right? It's a point A to point. We don't even have to talk. We have a good time on that road trip, right? Don't stop me on my journey, babe. Come on, let's go. We need to get to Bethlehem. They finally get there. And when they get there, what happens? There's no room for them in the inn. He says, but hey, we do have this stable over here that you can be in. They go to the stable, stay the night there, and baby Jesus is born. No hospitals, nothing's been sterilized, no doctors, no nurses, not even her mom was there. It was just her and Joseph in a stable. In a lowly place, Jesus is born. Can you imagine what that must be like? If you've ever had a child and you've been to the hospital and had a child at the hospital, it's scary just going through that. Can you imagine doing that alone with nobody else there? Because that was the situation that Mary and Joseph, they found themselves in. You say, why did God do that? Why would he allow it to happen that way? Why did Jesus come that way. Matthew 121 says this. It says, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You see, the angel said, give this baby the name Jesus, which means the Lord of salvation. Let's just give him the name Jesus because that's what he is here for. He's here to save these people from their sins. I love what, 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 when we think about this, what this means for you and for me. Because Mary and Joseph had a choice to make. Joseph could have responded with saying, I'm not going to be with you at all. I am completely done. But what does he do? He responds like anybody would who knew that God was with him. Which leads us to the next thought. What would be our response in a situation like that? How would we take that? How would we take what, what, what Mary and Joseph were going through And how will we do that even today? Because you see, for us, we're going, well, we understand the story. We've heard it many times. We probably have read it. Every year, our family sits down on Christmas morning, and our tradition is we have a nice breakfast, we read Luke 2, we talk about the story, and then we open presents. That's what we do. We read this story over and over and over again. But a question for us as we think about this today is, what do we do with Jesus See, I don't know where you came in here today. For some, maybe you come to church quite often. Maybe you go to a different church. Maybe you don't go to church at all. Maybe you're here today and you're like, you know, I'm here basically because I have a drug problem. Maybe a mom or a dad or a son or a daughter or an aunt or an uncle or a friend or a coworker, they invited you and literally they just kind of drug you to church today, right? The reason you're here is because somebody drug you here. You're like, I'm only here, Scott, because I got a drug problem. That's it. I mean, I'm just kind of hanging out. And now you're asking me, what am I going to do with Jesus? Because it's the most important question that any of us can ask ourselves. What do we do with him? How do we handle this? Where do I go in my life with Jesus? We're going to think about things like, what's 2020 going to look like in my life? And what will I do with Jesus in 2020? I love what John 14, 6 says. It says, Jesus said to them, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. It's only through Jesus that we can have a relationship with him. See, that's the whole reason that Jesus came. The Bible said that he came to be the propitiation or the payment, the penalty, the the payment for our sins. See, because every single one of us, we all have sin in our life. 
Romans 3, verse 10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Not one of us are righteous all the time. So because of that, we're eternally separated from God. And so Jesus came into the world to live a perfect life. He never sinned one time, and then he died on a cross. We hear that and we go, wow, he lived 33 years and never sinned once. Not once. Well, Scott, you gotta understand, Jesus didn't have kids. If he had kids, he would have sinned, right? I'm down with that. I kind of believe that myself. I mean, it's like, okay, I have kids. I sin a lot because I have kids. It's not me. It's them. I mean, obviously. <laughs> Never sinned once. Most of us can't, can't stop sinning in every 33 minutes. For some of us, every 33 seconds we sin, right? A thought comes in. We say something. We do something. And the reason Jesus came was so that you and I could have a personal relationship with him what he wants with every single one of us. You see, it's not about golf balls. It's not about clothes. It's not about a gaming system. It's not about a toy. It's about a baby being born of a virgin and living a perfect life. And the greatest gift that any of us could ever receive this season is the gift of Jesus. Here's the problem for many of us. For many of us, we want just enough Jesus to save us but not enough Jesus to change us. We want just enough Jesus to save me and get me to heaven. But do we really want to give everything to him and say, God, I am all in. And for many people today, we have a head knowledge of who Jesus is. The question is, do we have a heart knowledge? Do we have an understanding of what God has done in our own heart and in our own life? Sunday, we had the opportunity to baptize four boys, four brothers. It was an incredible experience. To listen to their stories and to see what God did in their life and what he's brought them to. Earlier today, I had the opportunity to baptize my son. 19 years, my wife and I have prayed for that day. Countless nights, praying and asking God to do a miracle. And when you see a life changed, it gives you hope. You see, Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus is the one who we can look at and go, he's the author and finisher of my faith. The only reason I can even have faith is because what he has done for me. And I don't know where you are today. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know how you came in here today. You may have come in here because you have a drug problem. You come in because you're like, it's just time to go to church. Maybe it's an every week thing. But what will we do with Jesus? Will we put him as the Lord of our life in 2020? Or is it just something that I just want enough just to save me, but not enough to truly change me? Jesus came because he wants a relationship with you and every single one of us. And our prayer is this year as we enter 2020, may he be the one who is worthy of all of our honor and attention, and gratitude, because he's the one who gave us life. Let's pray today. Father, we're so thankful for what you've done for us. Lord, you, you allowed your one and only son to come and be born and to live a perfect life and to die on a cross so that we could have a relationship with you. Father, our prayer is, is that as we think about that and reflect on what you is, God, would you help us to remember it and to understand it? May we commit our life to you as we never have before. Father, we thank you for loving us the way that you do. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. I don't know where you came in here today. I don't know what's going on in your life. But the most important thing that any of us could ever hear this year is that really having a relationship with him is as simple as A, B, C. It's admitting that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's believing that Jesus did live this on this earth and he did die on the cross and he did pay for our sins. Romans 10, 9 tells us that if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We'll have a relationship with him. You see, the gifts around our tree this year, 
That's not the greatest gift ever. Jesus is. A personal relationship with him is what it's all about. If you don't know him, would you let us have a conversation with you? See, as you came in today, you received a little, a little pamphlet. On the bottom of it, it says, about you. The other side says, next steps. We believe around this place that every one of us has a next step to take. The question for us is, what is that step? Maybe you're here today and you say, Scott, I, I, don't, I don't know where I land with all this. I've got some questions about who God is. I'd like to sit down and have a conversation. If that's you, you just check number one there. We'll give you a call and set up a time to meet and answer any questions you might have and just show you from the word of God how you can have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe say, you know, I, I think I've prayed to receive Christ. I just have some questions about where I'm at with that and I'd like to let somebody know. Would you let us know? We'd love to have a conversation about that. Answer any questions you have. Get you a Bible, get you some helps and, and know how to really build that relationship with Jesus. Maybe you never have taken that step of baptism. Maybe it's time to take that step. It's time to publicly profess your love for Jesus. You see, I don't know where you are today, but every one of us has an opportunity to make a decision for him. Would you make that before you go today? It's as simple as just filling that out, folding it up, and then dropping it in the next step box before you go today. God, and we think about what God's done in our hearts and in our own lives. And we realize that the world that we live in today, it's not getting any better. The Bible tells us that it's a dark place. I love what Matthew 5, 16 says. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. For those of us who have a relationship with Jesus, the message is that we're to be a light to a lost and to a dying world. And we get to choose what kind of light we are going to be. Are we going to be a light that's set apart, that's set in a city that others can see? Or are we going to keep our light dim? It's a choice we make every single day. And our prayer would be that 2020 would be the year that we let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and see our deeds and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Would you stand with us as we sing a few songs that remind us of this? And as we sing them, may we think that in our minds, what am I going to do with Jesus in 2020?